Good morning, afternoon, and evening to all the participants, colleagues, and speakers. Thank you very much for joining us today for the IWRA 2021 online conference FAO special session on bugs and superbugs, water quality and food safety, and preventing environmental antimicrobial resistance, AMR. My name is Omar El Hassan, and I'm pleased and honored to be moderating this special session. Dr. Stevens is an international policy analyst in the office of the Center Director at the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition at the United States Food and Drug Administration. Dr. Stevens works closely with international organizations and foreign regulatory counterparts on food safety, science and safety related issues. I would like to now introduce Dr. Sasha Kuoshima, Deputy, Deputy Director of the Land and Water Division at FAO, who will provide introductory and welcome remarks. Sasha has nearly 30 years of experience in international assistance, policy development in agriculture and water and the environment, natural resources management, integrated land and water management, and land management and restoration. Currently, as the De Deputy Director of the Land and Water Division and Head of Water at FAO, she leads programs on agricultural water development, land restoration, governance, geospatial data, and integrated water resources management with linkages to climate, energy, health, and nutrition. Thank you all again for joining us today. And Sasha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Omar, and distinguished guests, colleagues, and, and ladies and gentlemen. A big welcome to you all uh, to attend the UN FAO's special session at this year's International Water Resources Association on Bugs and Superbugs. I'm delighted to have you with us today. And FAO's Land and Water Division's mission is to enhance agricultural productivity as well as safety under sustainable use of land and water resources. We're here today on One Water, One Health issues. And this addresses an integral part and an integ integral concept of water as reflected in the SDGs 6, the Sustainable Development Goal 6, which is to ensure the availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. What this means, it includes access to safe, reliable, and sustainable water, including irrigation water, and also water use for food production and processing, as well as management and adequate practices, including reuse of water, water efficiency, and the protection of essential services by aquatic ecosystems under uh, the umbrella of what we know as integrated water resources management. We all heard um, in the earlier segment that water is a diminishing resource globally, and not all food primary producers and processors have access to safe water sources. The environment is also most affected by human activities. Besides pathogens, there are antimicrobial residues from the use of antibiotics in livestock, as well as humans, along with all the other pollutants that end up in our waters, soil, and land. Antimicrobial resistant bacteria can also be found in these environment, as well as environment and human waste streams, farmed seafood, and foods of plant origin. So some of the major challenges we're facing today lies at the intersection of water, food safety, public health, and also environment, AMR. Traditional approaches have failed to address these linkages adequately uh, between waterborne diseases and the management of livestock waste and pre-harvest risks and threats to global food safety posed by contaminated water sources and the development and spread of AMR in the environment. Through sustainable land and water management for agriculture and livestock production. At FAO, with our partners, we look to enhance monitoring of pre-harvest factors using multi-barrier risk man management techniques and also new tools, such as genome tracking of pathogens or metagenomic science and hydrological modeling and other risk prevention measures as key to shifting the focus from responding to disease to preventing contamination at source. We need to consider in tandem principles of risk management approaches taken to ensure safe drinking water and also safe food that are risk and also evidence-based with risk reduction measures implemented within the framework of all overall water safety plans or other structured food safety management systems based on the prerequisite hygiene and hazard analysis and control points known as the HACCP 
with verification and also monitoring. However, in food production, there are many additional complexities that have to be addressed, mainly related to the high level of diversity and variability in food products, primary production, and also the various processing systems, the water food microbe interactions, the microbial hazards and the factors influencing their presence and control at different stages along the supply chain, and as well, the end use of the food products. Today, we have an excellent line of speakers and panelists to share their insights and to discuss the latest thinking and development in water quality and food safety under global health agenda. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you and all our partners in expanding this knowledge base for better understanding of the root causes and also potential environmental sources of produce contamination for protecting the global food supply to improve public health. Thank you, and I look forward to today's presentations and deliberations. Back to you, Omar. Thank you very much, Sasha. And now I would like to introduce our next speaker and also our keynote speaker, Dr. Steve Musser. Dr. Musser is the Deputy Director at the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. He has directed the center's research in precedent-setting areas of food and cosmetic safety research, which include food allergen detection, methods for detecting chemical contaminants, dietary supplement analysis, and the use of whole genome sequencing during foodborne illness outbreak investigations. Dr. Russell, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Uh, very nice introduction. I appreciate that. I'd really like to thank everyone, the organizers and uh, the audience for uh, being here today to listen to this. It's a real honor for me, and I'm very excited about this, uh, this uh, collaboration I want to talk about today. Um, that we've started a small pilot to look at uh, using whole genome sequencing and next generation sequencing approaches to look at agricultural water. There's some reasons for that that I'll go over in the, uh, in the talk. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at for now more than a decade is the importance of agricultural water and production of food and the One Health approach and its integral part of this process and impact on the quality and safety of food uh, and agriculture and people, animals as well. And it's a, it's a completely integrated approach and water turns out to be one of the best ways to examine and get good pictures of the microbial ecology and what's happening in the water in terms of pathogen levels and how they rise and fall during, during harvest or during production and the impact that that has on um, the impact that that has on agriculture and people. Um, and having thought about this for a number of years and worked on this, we thought, well, maybe the best way to approach this is by using uh, some of the emerging next generation sequencing approaches and then bringing people together to work in this area. So as I mentioned, uh, water uh, is an integral part of public health. It's an integral part of the environmental health and an integral part of food safety. Uh, we know that uh, uh, unsafe or contaminated water will have significant impacts on all of these areas. And so we are trying to figure out how best to monitor that. Um, if we use next generation sequencing approaches for this, uh, we can easily look at the ecology and the distribution and persistence of pathogens, as well as other organisms that might be healthy or might be providing um, good preventive controls uh, for pathogens in water. Um, and we're just sort of scratching the area in this, in this particular area and finding out more and more. It's, it's a very exciting work. Um, and then we combine this, we can do source tracking. We can find out where a particular product or a person might have gotten sick and maybe uh, figure out what the preventive controls are to prevent them from getting sick or the animals from getting sick or the water or the food from being contaminated. It all really helps in our understanding of, of how all of these things fit together uh, and water is the key. Water is the center of all of these, um, uh, these impacts. And we found it also to be an extremely easy place to, to, uh, to look. So why sequencing? Why, why look for the whole genome sequencing? People say, oh, it's expensive. It is, but when you consider how much information you get out of it and how inexpensive some of the newer technology is becoming, uh, you have one record for lots of information. So we can get AMR information, we can get resistance to things like sanitizers, we can get serotype information, you can find out microbial populations, 
uh, virulence factors that may be spreading between one organism and another organism. So you have essentially one record that contains sometimes thousands of data points and information about um, that particular pathogen or pathogens that are in the sample. Um, and if you make this data open access and available for people to look at throughout the world, and the, it becomes a real uh, record of what's going on and, and helping people understand what's happening with agricultural water in their areas as well as throughout the world where they can then compare samples from one area to another um, and look at uh, similarities and differences. Um, so what we've um, we'll talk a little bit about the model we're using and how we're doing our little pilot um, and how we'd like to expand uh, that pilot. Uh, so it's basically a little um, pyramid with the agricultural community at the top. Uh, they own the water typically or the water rights or are using the water in some way. And so we need to work with them. Um, and we're also working through academic organizations primarily throughout the world and in the United States. Um, we found that the uh, universities and the professors at these universities uh, generally can um, be out. They know the people in the agricultural community. They're trusted by those folks. They have good relationships. Not only that, they can also serve as advisors and subject matter experts to governments in their area or you know, in particular in the US, they've been helpful to us and our US uh, colleagues that help us. And it's a model that allows for everyone to benefit by working together in a collaborative means to study agricultural water. Um, and we've expanded this now to several other countries um, just to test it. And it's a, it's a really good model and it seems to uh, provide everyone with a, a good solution of how to how to share and manage data across uh, countries and, and people and platforms. We're, uh, we kicked this off in November of 2019 at a meeting um, that we held through the Joint Institute of Food Safety and Applied Nutrition in uh, Maryland. Um, they're associated with the University of Maryland. And it, I put the website up there if anyone's interested. A lot of the talks are recorded. It was a several day session. It was very good, lots of, um, lots of incredible work. Uh, we, co-sponsored it with FAO. Uh, we've been using FAO as a partner and they've just been incredible to help us with these, uh, these, uh, these meetings and workshops. So we're going to, uh, of course, with COVID, we were delayed in, in how we rolled out more of the pilot program and the consortium and how we're gonna uh, work together. Um, but we anticipate in the next um, fall or, or next year that we'll be having some fo a follow-up symposium to the first one. Uh, We've also uh, been partnering, as I mentioned, with FAO uh, to sponsor some regional meetings, uh, to have more discussions about this. And then the, the ninth water forum, uh, which will be in 2022, uh, we'd also like to be talking about this consortium more and more in that, in that area as well. So what are the goals? What are we trying to do here? So we'd like to build collaborations on pathogen monitoring and surface water. So the, the water that people are drawing from in ponds, lakes, rivers, um, and be able to um, generate a global network of people collaborating and working in this area, even if it's virtual, uh, where we're not all seeing each other in person. Uh, optimizing the methods. It turns out that there's, uh, for every person that we work with, there, there's a favorite way of doing water sampling. And um, we'd like to look at those methods and see if there's a way that we could recommend methods or provide um, technical assistance on how to do the methods, provide better methods, uh, be able to sample differently depending on parasites or if we're looking for viruses, if there's different approaches to doing that. So we have a whole group working on, uh, working on that issue. Um, if you want, we're also evaluating, we have a group evaluating new uh, next generation approaches and metagenomics technologies. Uh, we feel that metagenomics will have a particularly significant impact in this area, um, although we still have a lot to learn about how to use metagenomics in a way uh, that will provide uh, people with more information. We're also working on um, providing all of this information um, in a data sharing way to, to people that would like to participate. So. Uh, you can look at all of the data across the platforms and uh, provide help uh, in that type of analysis and approach. Um, 
We're also providing uh, free uh, software and data analysis tools so people don't have to develop their own tools and, and we're having people provide uh, software that is uh, it's open access, so it's not going to cost them. We have a, um, a SharePoint site for that, uh, which we can provide more people information about where to look, how to do it, what to what to look at. A uh, number of committees forming out of this uh, very simple uh, workshop we had a little over a year ago. Currently, uh, we have collaborators uh, in Brazil, Chile, Mexico, and throughout the United States, and we are looking for other people that would like to partner. Um, if you'd like to know who to contact, uh, we'd love to have people uh, commit to uh, joining this little consortium. It's little now. We hope it grows to be a, a much more significant course consortium. And uh, you can contact Eric Stevens. His email is, is uh, listed there. And he'll put you in touch with uh, you know, whatever group, uh, whatever committee, or whatever interest you might have, even if it's only general. Uh, we'd we'd love to have your uh, your participation in this because we think it's uh, it's really going to provide a lot of answers and a lot of keys to uh, to how we move forward in um, in water sampling and, and understanding uh, what and how we can keep water safe and agricultural water safe, food safe, people safe. And I think that's all for the day. Thank you all very much. I don't know if there's time for questions, but I do appreciate everyone's attention and I'm very happy that uh, you were able to attend this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Master, for that presentation and giving that overview of uh, whole genome sequencing with environmental surveillance relating to foodborne illness. And so now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Wagner. He Dr. Wagner was trained as a veterinarian and is a specialist in veterinary microbiology. He is a professor at the vet school in Utrecht, the Netherlands. He is director of the WHO World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Campylobacter and Antimicrobial Resistance from a One Health Perspective and of the OIE Reference Center for Campylobacteriosis. He is frequently acting as a consultant for WHO, FAO, and OIE in the field of food safety and antimicrobial resistance. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for, uh, for inviting me to give this presentation. What I do on behalf of the whole uh, group that prepared this, uh, what we call the tricycle protocol. It's a WHO model for integrated surveillance on antimicrobial resistance. And integrated surveillance means that uh, we are looking in humans and with going back in the uh, food chain and uh, also in the environment. Um, EC in the protocol, so the ESBL EC stands for E. coli. What we are aiming for is to set up a simple uh, method for all the member states uh, that can be implemented to measure and to do kind of benchmarking uh, of an, an one bacterium, Escherichia coli, uh, with one indicator for resistance, what is the extended spectrum back spectrum beta lactamase. It's a type of resistance that we don't like to see in, uh, in gram-negative bacteria, and we can use it as an indicator for, uh, for, for use of uh, antimicrobials, for example. Um, it's an, uh, an, we, we try to set up a simple surveillance across uh, three sectors. What I said, the human side, the food chain, and the environment. And the environment picture, is, it's not mine, it's definitely the Netherlands with uh, people on a bike and cows and very flat. But we are doing that in uh, different countries around the world. Um, so uh, it's the, the system allows comparison between countries. So in that way, it's kind of, of benchmarking and also to allow countries to assess the effect of interventions. If you are reducing, for example, antimicrobial use, what effect is there on the ESBL producing E. coli? Or if you have an increased biosecurity or that kind of things, um, you can measure. And for that reason, uh, we set up um, a couple of years ago, we designed this protocol and then we worked on improvement of the protocol, looked for implementation, uh, how practical it was. There are three uh, or four more technical uh, uh, working uh, work packages. Uh, the first is the surveillance in humans. 
and we are measuring on uh, two levels. One is in hospitals, and that is the ESBL producing E. coli in bloodstream infections. Um, as part of the uh, uh, of the whole E. coli, what what we find of uh, E. coli. Then in the community, what is the percentage of people carrying um, uh, healthy people carrying and the ESBL producing E. coli, and we are measuring that in uh, pregnant women. And in fact, it's it's quite unique in this project that we are looking in uh, healthy humans because there are not that many uh, surveillance systems where you look in healthy people. Work records two is the surveillance in the food chain, and then we have chosen for chicken uh, because it's uh, worldwide uh, eaten. Uh, there are no religious restrictions, and if you want to to sample animals, you can uh, quite easily get uh, uh, samples from local markets. Then uh, there is the surveillance in the environment, and that is uh, waste. Of, that is uh, water. So municipal water, uh, water from live uh, animal markets upstream and downstream waters from, from human waste from cities. Then there is a an, an work package four at your right hand, that's the molecular biology, and I can refer to the former speaker, and the intention is to do there the uh, whole genome sequencing of the isolates, and here the Danish Technical University, DTU, plays a very important role in providing this service. Then in work package five, you're doing the epidemiology and statistics. Uh, work package six is the aim, or aim usage and the residues. And then we have the management uh, on the country, regional and global level. So that's the setup of the project. As I said, we started this uh, project in, in pilot countries to find out what uh, if it was an, a practical way to do it. So uh, to improve the protocol, the protocol is uh, is now uh, approved, is launched earlier this year. So there is a for, it's uh, formally available, and the countries where we did the pilot was in the Afro uh, region, uh, Ghana, uh, Senegal, Madagascar, um, and so the the regions are the WHO regional offices. Uh, Emro, Pakistan and Jordan, uh, Shiro, Indonesia, India and Nepal, and uh, Vipro, uh, Malaysia. So in the next slide, so some results of the implementation and we keep it uh, anonymous because we only, so the owners of the data are the countries and we, uh, we leave it up to the countries to present their data. Um, you see the, here the results of five countries and uh, in the three or in, uh, uh, in humans and in the food chain, so in hospitals, in the community, and what we find in the Sika of uh, chicken. So you can already see that there is a huge difference between uh, what we find in, uh, in the results in humans. In the hospitals, we see one country where there is 76% uh, of positive um, ESBL producing E. coli, and the other is 22. Uh, in the community, there are also huge differences with 43% and 7% uh, in country five. And also in the food chain, we find uh, clear differences in the, uh, what we find in the uh, ESBL producing E. coli in chicken. And the next slide is uh, more for this session. That's on the results of the water. Um, here you see uh, three, uh, three countries in the country, the Netherlands. Uh, Heike Schmidt is heavily involved from the RIVM, uh, my colleague here from, uh, from the Netherlands, uh, and she was responsible for this uh, work package. What you can see is uh, the E. coli concentrations in upstream human waste, animal waste, and downstream water, and then also the ESBL concentrations. And what you see is uh, clear differences in upstream and downstream water from, um, uh, from cities. I will not go into more details from these, uh, for these pictures because of the time. So uh, we are very happy that this year there are other countries joining from Afro, Zimbabwe, uh, Zambia, Morocco, Nigeria, Burkina Faso. Uh, from the Emro region, it's Morocco, Iran, and Sudan, and Shiro, uh, Bhutan. So there are more countries joining the program. So the, the tricycle offers a unique multi-sectoral integrated surveillance program for, uh, for AMR. There are three sectors involved, so public health, the human side, the agricultural side, and the environmental side. Uh, we developed a protocol, what is launched, so it's really established now, and this should be stringently followed to generate robust data. Uh, we organized several 
courses where I've been involved. And what you see is that countries try to make shortcuts for to make the protocol a little bit easier. But uh, if you change the protocol, the idea of uh, benchmarking and comparing data between countries and within countries becomes more uh, difficult. So the protocol is published in really, really detail. And uh, if countries want to, uh, to join and everybody uh, who want to join is, is welcome to do that, but you have to uh, really to follow the, the protocol. To be sure that uh, the protocol will be followed in the right way, we also uh, provide online training models. Uh, they will become available very soon and, and uh, for all the member countries that want to, to join. Uh, the good news is also that uh, the Fleming Fund uh, countries with the, the with the country grants, they in most of the countries are supporting the tricycle uh, multi-sectoral integrated surveillance program of the uh, yeah of the tricycle. So we are very happy to, that uh, they also join this program. This was my short presentation about uh, this program, and I like to thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Raganar, about, about the for this presentation describing the Global Tricycle Surveillance Program and some of the experiences and lessons learned. Uh, with this, I would like to move forward to our next speaker, Dr. Kang Zhu. Dr. Kang Zhu is a food, and food safety and quality officer at the Food and Agriculture Organization. He is one of the joint FAO WHO expert meeting on micro, microbiological risk assessment, GEMRA secretariats to provide micro microbiological risk assessment and scientific advice to Codex Alimentarius to support the development of international guidelines and standards, and also transfer the technology to member countries for capacity development. So hello everyone, I'm, uh, I'm Kangzhou, a food safety officer working in the uh, food system and um, food safety division of the uh, FAO. I'm very happy to present our work, the GEMRA work on microbiological hazards and the safety and quality of water used in food production. So food safety has always been an important issue and um, currently it is high on the political agenda of many countries. Uh, World Bank reported that the, U, the unsafe food cost low and um, middle income country about 110 billion US dollars in lost pr productivity medical expense and trade every year. So it is highly related to the US SDGs to animate the poverty, zero hunger, keep good health and support economic growth. By the globalization, the expansion of international trade in food has increased the risk of microbiological hazard being transferred from the original point of production to location that may be thousands of kilometers away. The consequence of this is that there is an increased risk to human health as well as implication of international trade in food and ultimately the food producers. So it is not only a health problem, but also an economic problem. The most efficient way to deal with food safety issue is not to address them after they happened, but to prevent. A strong international institutions and trust is also must. So preventative measures and an integrated approach is the key and the food safety management makes food safety a shared responsibility. Today is the World Food Safety Day. It has the slogan, food safety is everyone's business. And we agree that it is not safe, it is not food. To tackle the food safety issues, the consensus is to use the risk analysis tools. So the joint and WHO scientific advice program, including the joint FAO and WHO expert meeting on microbiological risk assessment, the GEMRA, which I'm working for, and also JECFA on chemical and GMPR on pesticides, was established to provide scientific-based and also risk-based evidence to support the work from Codex Alimentarius to establish the international food standards. So there are so many specific topics on food safety, but water is a major input in food production from primary production through all stages in the food value chain to consumption. 
Water can contact food directly or indirectly and is used in maintenance of hygiene and sanitation throughout the food chain. Water is a diminishing resource globally and not all food primary producers and also processors have as, uh, access to safe water resource. Here are just some examples that and serve to highlight the fact that water is critical not only for human consumption, but also for the production of all our food and most of our, of our consumer products. So the codex is setting international food safety standards. For the use of water in food processing, there are two water quality categorized, which used in codex. One is the portable and another one is clean. Where clean is considered of lower quality than portable, the term clean water defined by the codex as water which does not compromise the safety of the food in the context of its use is used in a number of codex texts. The challenging for the competent authorities or other implementing codex standards and guidelines is to translate this guidance recommending the use of clean water into operational guidance for primary producer and food processor, allowing them to monitoring such targets as part of their food control or food safety management program whereas portable water needs to meet the safety and quality standards of drinking water, which is often not feasible, practical, or responsible solution for agricultural purpose. And it is also scarce, especially in rural settings. CCFH noted the importance of water safety and quality in food production and processing, requested GEMRA to produce guidance on processing water, so we organized three meetings already to address this issue since 2017 and placed a great emphasis on risk-based approach for safety and quality water used in food. A fit for purpose concept was developed by taking consideration the context of water used along the food chain without compromising the safety of the final products. Risk assessment based on scientific advice is essential for the fit for purpose concept. We also developed the infographic in the left to present the, the uh, relationship of risk assessment, the monitoring program with the fit for purpose concept. The meeting in 2018 emphasized the importance of sustainable management of global water resources, which are under stress from population growth and environmental challenges. There are similarities in the principle of risk management approaches taken to ensure safety, drinking water, and safe food. However, in food production, there are additional complexities that has to be addressed related to the high level of diversity and variability in food productions, primary productions, and processing system, water, food, and also microbial interaction microbial hazards and the factors influencing their presence and control at different stage along the supply chain and the end uh, use of food products. We also de developed the decision tree, which was developed for fresh produce, fish, fishery, and water reuse, were considered to be a useful risk management tours to assist stakeholders in making decision on the water fitness for purpose and the required quality for use or reuse at a given step in the supply chain. Still, we identify there are some gaps and we also try to address them in the following meetings. The meeting on microbiology criteria for the water used in fresh produce was convenient in 2019 which emphasized again that the risk-based approach should be, a, should be used, but take consideration of the intended purpose of the water, the methods applied, and also the stage of the production, as well as the characteristics of the products and also the microbiological hazards. The consensus on, and also the conclusion from the expert panel, which supported by different case, case studies is that no one water quality microbial indicator is appropriate or useful for all, for all the water type. And for some water types, 
there, there may not even be a single useful indicators. So there might be several indicators for some of the water. So the, the, working, uh, the work of GEMRA on water is still ongoing. And we will have the fourth meeting on the microbiological hazard and the criteria for the fishery and dairy sector the next week to identify the water used and at what point it is introduced to describe the measures used for feedful purpose. And thank you. And a special thanks for all the experts, resource people, and secretaries for all the meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zhu, for this very interesting and very important presentation outlining some of the microbiological hazards that we have to face when looking at the intersection of water quality and reuse and food safety, and also describing some of the GEMRA meetings and some of the outcomes. And with this, uh, this was the last of our three speakers. And now I would like to pass the floor to my co-moderator, uh, Eric Stevens, to open the panel discussion. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Hi, thanks, Omar. Um, and again, uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to everybody. It's so exciting to see this many participants. Um, we are going to be having a 30-minute-ish panel session now on the legal, regulatory, and standard setting and human health perspectives and experiences of the intersection of water quality, food safety, public health, and AMR issues. And I'm joined today by some of our distinguished panelists. And I have a few questions that I'm going to begin the session with, and then we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, before I ask my first question and kind of introduce um, the panelists, my name is Eric Stevens, probably should have started with that. Um, I work at the United States Food and Drug Administration, um, the International Affairs staff, and I help coordinate a lot of our international engagements and collaboration, um, which means that I get to be a part of distinguished events like this. Um, so today we have um, four individuals that will be our experts today. Um, we have Carmen Bouillon, she's a legal officer from FAO. We have Kate Metalclap from the, the WHO and works with uh, wastewater. We have Cornel Neeson from uh, the uh, Technical University of um, <clears throat> Denmark, and she works with the Seek Africa Project. And we have Sarah Cahill, who works with the Codex, Codex Elementarius um, from FAO. Um, so I will begin with asking my first question, which will kind of be a two-parter, um, and I will ask this to each of the panelists, um, give you a chance to kind of introduce yourselves more and describe a little bit about the work that you do. Um, so the first question really will center on the work that you do in exploring the relationships between water, agriculture, and human health in light of increasing demand on water and natural resources, really through the lens of sustainable development. And so in providing kind of a brief one or two minute kind of response to the work that you do, please feel free to really um, introduce yourself a little bit more to um, the audience today. So Carmen, we'll begin with you. Thank you very much, Eric. And um, I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this panel. So thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Carmen Bouillon, and I'm a legal officer in the FAO Development Law Service. This is one of the two services in the FAO Legal Office, and it provides assistance to countries and regional organizations for the revision and development of their legislation in all matters under the mandate of the FAO. So among our work on a range of agricultural and natural resources areas, we're currently paying a lot of attention to the interface between legislation and antimicrobial resistance. In close collaboration with other FAO technical divisions represented in the multidisciplinary AMR working group, as well as with the OIE and the WHO in the framework of the tripartite plus unit. For the past five years, and to facilitate our work supporting countries strengthening their AMR-related legislation, we have been working on the development of an FAO methodology to analyze AMR-relevant legislation in the food and agricultural sectors. I will put the link to this methodology in the chat right after my intervention. So during this time, we have applied this methodology in 25 countries and a regional organization, and we have conducted multi-country workshops in Africa, Asia, Central Asia, and Latin America. 
We are currently working with our tripartite partners on the upgrade of this methodology into a One Health AMR legal assessment tool that will also incorporate the human health sector. These tools take into consideration the whole gamut of regulatory areas that are relevant for AMR, including water law. Within the framework of water legislation, we have worked on the identification of the elements of water law that could be relevant for AMR, from the use of water as an input for agriculture and aquaculture to water pollution, water quality standards, or the release into the environment of water potentially contaminated with residues of antimicrobials or with resistant bacteria or genes, contributing towards the development and spread of AMR. The potential entry points for AMR in water legislation are very varied, and these have direct impacts on human, animal, and environmental health. Dr. Masser before has very clearly explained the importance of water for AMR. AMR can be spread uh, from agricultural activities, such as farms or aquaculture establishments into the environment, and then from con contaminated water or soil into the food chain and consumed as food or water. Resistant bacteria or genes spread into water or the environment can also affect biodiversity and be harmful to water dependent, dependent ecosystems. Each of these areas might be regulated through different legal instruments, such as general environmental law, water law, food safety and quality legislation, fisheries and aquaculture legislation, or sustainable crop and livestock production related legislation. The methodology identifies these various areas and elements as well as the key regulatory mechanisms governments can, can put in place to facilitate their enforcement. Let me give you an example of how legislation can address the connection between water quality used for irrigation and AMR bacteria on food, um, particularly on fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, general water law may include different responses to this issue, including the development and implementation of water quality standards, obligations on water treatment and pollution control. Legislation should grant the authorities in charge of water for irrigation the power to setting, monitoring, and enforcing these standards. And governments should also be vested with the power to verify, verify maximum limits of antimicrobial residues, as well as the microbial content of the water. Legislation is also needed to restrict and control proximity of certain agricultural activities to surface or underground water bodies, contributing to prevent environmental contamination with antimicrobial residues and resistant bacteria. This could apply to pharmaceutical companies, farms, or aquaculture establishments where antimicrobials are used and potentially discharged into the environment. It can be regulated through environmental impact assessments, licensing or permits for the discharge of wastewater, prohibitions of discharge in certain areas, rules on collection and treatment prior to discharge, or standards relating to the quality of treated water, to name a few. Along the same lines, AMR criteria can be introduced in the treatment and management of sewage sludge and the reuse of wastewater in agriculture. And these should be, should be subject to the same level of treatment as uh, other wastewater systems. Similarly, fisheries and aquaculture legislation may also contain provisions on water quality to determine the location of aquaculture activities, the quality of water used as input, or to prevent unacceptable levels of antimicrobials. Finally, coordination among all public and private stakeholders is also essential to contribute to fight against um, AMR. In fact, the Global Action Plan requir requires countries to develop national action plans that, among other elements, provide for a mechanism for collaboration across all entities with a role on AMR. It is utmost important that entities working on water and the environment are part of this discussion and that this coordination is crystallized through appropriate legislation. It is due to these important connections that AMR has been considered as the quintessence of One Health. Paying attention to AMR through strengthened water law contributes to sustainable agricultural production, one health, and the fulfillment of the sustainable development goals. And this is all from my part, Eric. I hope I didn't, I, I was not too, too uh, long. Over no, to that you. was perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to move on to uh, Sarah Cahill, ask her um, just to introduce herself very briefly and provide a brief description of the work that she does at the intersection of um, water, agriculture, and human health. So Sarah, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Eric, and thanks again to the organizers for inviting Codex to be part of this discussion. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, the, the Codex Alimentarius Commission is an intergovernmental body that's responsible for the development of food safety and quality standards that protect consumers' health and facilitate fair practices in food trade. And these standards are recognized as the benchmark standards for the safety of food tr traded internationally under the, the World Trade Organization Agreement on applica the application of sanitary and phytosanitary measures. So protecting consumer health has always been at the center of our standards and um, all our standards are based on assessments of the risk to human health. The impact of, of other factors on food safety, such as water availability and demand, traditionally were considered in the risk management discussion amongst our members. So first and foremost, we consider the, the, the risk to human health and then other factors are also considered in the development of the standards. However, I would say our approach to how we do that and think more holistically is, is changing. And recently in the revision of one of our cornerstone standards, um, the general principles of food hygiene, uh, which includes a whole guidelines on the HACCP that Sasha mentioned at the beginning, water use is absolutely critical and um, it highlights you know, the, the use of water in contact with food and uh, in cleaning and sanitation and, and the huge role that water really plays in ensuring that we can deliver safe food, particularly microbiologically safe food. And when reviewing that, there was a clear need to uh, identify, to revisit how we deal with water and food safety and that it was no longer enough to just simply refer to use potable water or use clean water as Kang mentioned earlier. And you know, considering as well, I think the amount of water, you know, 70% of water goes into, into food production and processing. So we have a huge demand for water in our, in our sector. And uh, it's not all food processors have access to, to safe water sources. And for others as well, as we were discussing in Codex, it became clear that even those who have safe water access, other, there are other challenges that they're facing and they're incurring increasing financial and environmental costs due to water discharge, for example. So clearly there was a need for us to rethink how we start looking at water in the context of uh, food safety. So as a result of this recognition then, uh, Codex did decide to develop general guidance for the safe sourcing, use and reuse of water in food processing. And that is a work that's currently underway. As I mentioned, since our standards are science-based, we request FAO and WHO to provide us with the science that underpins those. And Kang has kindly already provided an overview of some of the signs that will now be taken by uh, Codex and by our member countries and converted into guidance that all countries can hopefully use to, um, to really improve the way in, in which they source water for safety, that they find water that's fit for purpose and that um, we can reuse water within food processing while not impacting on the safety and quality of food. And while doing that, we will also look at some specific examples and build on the work that FAO and WHO has done, looking specifically at the areas of fresh produce, for example, and, and the fishery sector where water is, is key. Um, having said that, I also wanted to reflect on some other work that we're doing right now, and, and especially AMR, since um, that's an important topic in the discussions today as well. And a few years ago, we decided to, in Codex, update our existing standards on, on antimicrobial resistance, and in particular, our code of practice to minimize and contain foodborne AMR. And our reason for doing that was really to bring in this whole One Health approach to food safety. So whereby we're not just uh, thinking about the food, but also the surrounding environment and what's in that environment and how that can contribute to the safety of the food. So I think this is also a, a great advance in terms of the standards we're developing that we're looking from a more holistic and One Health approach to to uh, addressing these. And this means we consider aspects such as water, such as the environment when we're doing this. And one other aspect just to mention in relation to antimicrobial resistance is that we're also developing guidelines on the integrated monitoring and surveillance of foodborne AMR. And um, this again is to, to try and promote that ever critical data collection efforts that, that are essential to inform risk management. And I think some of the efforts that YAP described in WHO and, and others that are ongoing will be, you know, really work very well with what we're promote, trying to promote in Codex, which is to actually go out there and start collecting data in, in this area. So I think I'll stop there, Eric, and uh, thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, now we will turn over to Kate from WHL. Uh, again, please uh, briefly introduce yourself and describe um, some of the work that you've been doing. Over to you. Sure. Yeah, so I'm uh, Kate Nicot, Sanitation and Wastewater Team Leader at WHO in Geneva. Um, obviously, you know, within WHO, we have big collaborations on food safety through Codex and, and other things, as well as a large team working in the Antimicrobial Resistance Secretariat. Um, what I'd like to do now is just tell you a bit about what we do in the, in the water team at this, this interface we've been talking about today. Um, so specifically in my team, we work on the, the normative aspects related to anything to do with kind of dirty water. So those things like guidelines on sanitation and health, recreational water quality, which is impacted by both human and animal inputs, as well as safe use of wastewater and agriculture. Um, and so all of those work on a common risk-based framework. And it's really nice to see the same approach coming out across all of these things. It's, it's really the kind of bedrock on, of the thinking about how all of us kind of approach this, this problem. Um, I also work across a couple of disease portfolios, which are often thinking in a very kind of curative perspective, but making sure that kind of water aspects are included. So things like neglected tropical diseases, and I'm also the, the focal point for, for antimicrobial resistance in the environment. Um, but I think kind of what's, um, well, I should first say that, you know, within all of that, for this, this, these issues of food safety, what is upstream of that is, is untreated human waste. And frankly, the numbers on that remain shocking. 4.2 billion people in the world who don't have their, their wastewater or fecal sludge treated to at least a secondary level. So there's a huge amount of work just to be done in, in that space, getting the basics right. And to that end, we recently published a State of the World Sanitation Report, really called and calling for an urgent acceleration of, of all the work around uh, sanitation and wastewater management from human settings. Um, but generally speaking, I would say that within WHO, we, we, we normally try to stick quite close to our, our mandate of human health, but I think there's these there's, there's currents that are going on in terms of sustainable development um, and the sort of increasing complexity that means we need to really think globally and then using more of a, a One Health approach. And obviously, you know, COVID has demonstrated that, thankfully it's, not a water related one, um, but, but uh, likewise in antimicrobial resistance. We're really trying to, to work to have um, environmental dimensions better reflected in national action plans. And to that end, we recently published a technical brief with FOE on that. Um, and also trying to scale up the work on safe use of wastewater in agriculture. Sorry, my dog is barking in the background, which is probably disturbing you. And I think I've said enough. So back to you, Eric. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. And that is uh, that's quite all right. Um, you can't see my, my cat right now, but he's been knocking over everything in the background. Um, um, so now we're going to be moving finally over to our, our last panelist for introductions. And this will be Pernille. Um, so please, again, um, just introduce yourself and briefly describe the work that you've been doing. Over to you. Thank you so much. I would also like to say that I'm very honored to be invited uh, and attend here as a panelist um, and considered an expert here. Um, my name is Penilla Nilsson and I am the project manager for Seek Africa, uh, which is led by the Danish Technical University in Denmark. Um, it's a Fleming fund uh, funded project, a regional grant, and uh, we are working to develop and support whole genome sequencing and uh, bioinformatics capacity for AMR surveillance across Africa. So uh, what we do through our partners um, acting as regional and national sequencing centers is to offer sequencing and uh, data analysis services in a One Health framework and, uh, and building sustainable local capacity also through uh, training. So we've had several training sessions in uh, whole genome sequencing and uh, how to analyze that type of data. Uh, so basically we are um, we're generating data that can be used um, to guide changes in policy um, and practice uh, by filling in some of the, of the current knowledge gaps and, uh, and add to the evidence base that is really needed um, uh, 
particularly on the environmental aspect. But um, to date, a lot of our, um, our data comes from human clinical samples, but we do also have data coming in from animals, um, for instance, poultry farms, uh, as well as environmental samples. And uh, here I would like to highlight our collaboration with uh, the WHO tricycle project in Ghana, uh, where we are currently generating whole genome sequencing data uh, on the ESBL producing E. coli from um, most of our samples that we are running through now are from uh, wastewater uh, and a couple uh, from the uh, poultry. So uh, that can be then used to look at the clonality and um, resistance genes. Um, and, and then we're also continuously seeking and accepting collaborations uh, just in general to, um, to just build capacity and generate data. Yeah, I think that was it for me uh, at this point. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, so now we'll be moving on to our second question. Um, and again, we'll, we'll go through our panelists one by one. Um, can you identify the levers that would deliver wide ranging positive changes to our food systems? that leads to safe food and environment while also boosting production with a limited water footprint. So Carmen, um, we'll begin with you. Thank you very much, Eric. So um, I've mentioned before the importance and the need to strengthen institutional and policy coordination across all areas um, uh, with a role on AMR or more broadly across all areas that are related to water management. Uh, because effective and efficient multi-level governance involves uh, promoting cooperation and pulling resources and technical capacities. And this is indeed challenging for countries. And it, it requires not only the, the appropriate political will, but also the appropriate resources, as well as effective monitoring, implementation and enforcement mechanism. Um, legislation can help um, and is actually key to facilitate this coordination as it paves the way for a sustainable implementation over the years beyond the political will. Legal instruments supportive of institutional coordination can clarify the roles and responsibilities of all actors. They can set up mechanisms for policy development, implementation and enforcement, and introduce financial mechanisms that will ensure its sustainability. Community involvement and stakeholder participation in policy making, including uh, through water uses associations, river basing organizations, or catchment management agencies are uh, also critical to these approaches and their role can be made explicit in legislation. The attention must be paid to vulnerable and marginalized groups, as well as to the rights of indigenous communities. Um, but more specifically, in relation to uh, the substantive elements of water legislation, um, um, legislation uh, water legislation may underpin many other mechanisms that could leverage sustainable production and positive, positive change to our food systems. Some examples of these can be the recognition of different types of water tenure rights associated with different categories of water use, as well as with goals such as security, equity, or efficiency, or the legal protection of basic priority uses, such as water for drinking or domestic consumption above other water uses, or abstraction limits and optimum uh, use prescriptions. Um, many laws around the world uh, impose a duty on the competent authority to prescribe abstraction and use limits in connection with licenses or other authorized use, as well as penalty, uh, penalties uh, such as revocations of um, licenses or authorizations for those who do not comply. Um, also, fiscal and technology incentives feature in legislation can encourage rational use. Um, as well as uh, uh, mechanisms um, for the transfer or trade of permits uh, that allow flexibility when an allocated volume is in unused, facilitating rational use and conservation of resources, or payments for water set, uh, ecosystem, or environmental services, um, which allow downstream beneficiaries to, contra to contract with upstream landowners to carry out particular land management services. Um, environmental and social aspects also feature in water legislation and may, for example, condition, condition the issuance of water permits to facilitate rational and sustainable water use. Um, I mentioned already the environmental impact assessment, which are often prerequisites for granting concessions for water use. Um, ecological, ecological protection zones or protected areas can be established in legislation to preserve certain uses, such as human consumption. 
um, water reserves for research for ecological or social needs it might, might also be protected in legislation. Um, provisions on pollution control uh, are found in the legislation of different sectors and may range from a simple statements prohibiting pollution with corresponding penalties to provisions that enshrine the polluter pays principle. So as you can see, there are many potential mechanisms through which legislation, including water legislation, may facilitate positive change and contribute to sustainable agri-food systems while contributing also to human rights to food, health and the environment or to one health um, and to reduce the water footprint. Over to you, Eric. Thank you very much, Carmen. Uh, Sarah, would you like to identify some lovers for us, please? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. And this is a, a super interesting question. So I'll just talk about it a little bit from a food safety perspective and um, how, how do we engage that sector in, in this effort to, to look at food systems more broadly and address the issue of, of limited water. And I think a key aspect from my perspective is, is the engagement and collaboration. How do we get people to work outside or to look outside of their own specific area? You know, our members are very keen on, on food safety and, and their key thing is to make sure that that doesn't impact human health. And what we're asking them to do now is, well, when you're doing that, you also need to consider all of these other factors. And what are, how are we going to incentivize them to do that? How are we going to ensure that they think about this in, in a broader perspective. And I think by, by presenting them with, with some of the data that's there, by presenting them with, with the, the challenges, the impact that you know, reduced water resources will have for food safety, we can promote them and encourage them then to actually take action from their side as well. But, but this, this does need some effort. And I, and I think that collaboration and engagement doesn't happen without necessarily getting the data to the people in the different sectors to show them what their role is. Um, another very important aspect, I, I think, is, is science. I mean, I know our standards are based in science, but we need to be able to um, have the science and the data to show that by changing the way we do things, by changing the way we use water, we're not going to compromise the safety of our food. So, and, and this is where this, this data collection, we, we heard from Pernil and also from Steve earlier about new technologies, genome sequencing, that's the data that's out there. And, and I think all of, all of the new sources of data and um, information allow us to start demonstrating better where problems are coming from and how we can address them in, in different ways. And I think this would be really critically critical in moving forward. And very quickly, then the third thing I would say is, is behavior change. How do we then change the behavior at the ground level to ensure that you know these these new innovations, this new science is, is actually taken up. I mean, in Codex, one of the reasons we started working on this was some countries came and said, it's now costing me uh, money to get rid of my wastewater. So I want another solution. So I think um, these, these are some of the areas that if we develop these on engagement science and, and then um, behavioral change, we will be able to move forward. Thanks, Eric. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, Kate, over to you. Yeah. Um, well, and firstly, I don't think I, you know if I if I was able to identify these levers, then I would you know we'd all be a lot better off for it. But I've got a, a few ideas to to propose. I, I think just thinking about a safe use of of wastewater and agriculture that that's actually something that we've been talking about for a really long time, and it's always kind of made been a, a slightly sort of niche topic. Um, but I, I sort of see that with the climate change agenda and with uh, the circular economy that's now quite well embedded in the SDGs, there's a, there's a sort of a chance to, to reinvigorate that topic, you know, thinking about, um, about you know, what is the vulnerability of our sanitation systems to, to, um, to climate change events, you know, how do we build resilience into to future investments and, and, and within that resilience to for other sectors too, by, by you know, increasing resilience of agriculture or energy um, through through reuse of nutrients. So I, I think we could we could do more in that space to to show the opportunities that that exist in, within the climate and circular economy agenda. Another kind of recurring thought I always have is around the One Health agenda. Um, I I think like for everybody, it's it's very easy to conceive get on board with that idea it makes an awful lot of sense but when we come down to the sort of 
pro project and programmatic level, sometimes it's quite hard to figure out who does what, when does it make sense to really work together and when does it make sense to work separately. So, so I think we have some way to go to really understand how One Health works operationally. And I think we, we need to sort of invest in that as a, as a, as a project, as an international community. And that, indeed, that's actually happening with a lot of um, new work coming up as interagency work around, around the One Health agenda. The third thing I would say is, um, I think we sort of need to get out of our comfort zone as, as researchers and as UN agencies. Um, I think we're very comfortable at this kind of science policy interface of so convening the scientific community, producing norms and standards. And I'm certainly not saying we should, we should walk away from that, that's our, that's our bread and butter. But I, I think we need to, to move more into the kind of the how-to space, you know, looking at interoperability of, of policies and guidelines between sectors, how we clarify and reform mandates maybe between between traditional ways of, of doing things, thinking about more how we, we incentivize non-state actors, public-private partnerships, financing models, behavior change, and also kind of trying to, to demonstrate incremental pathways to, to improvement um, in addition to the, you know, the kind of high normative standard we might set. So um, yeah, I, th I think some of that stuff is the, is the really, hard things and it's not necessarily figured out in, in laboratories and with with microscopes but um it's it's uh i think going to be you know the really key thing to taking from some of these sort of scientific ideas really into practice at scale so that's all from me thanks kate uh, and finally we'll we'll end with uh Pernille. over to you thank you Thank you. I, I think there's been some really, really excellent points made by uh, the other panelists and, and I just want to sort of uh, continue on what Kate just said that uh, uh, I think there is a need now to, to really start on the practical stuff and uh, to find a way to build this barrier between um, the water and food production uh, when, when the access of, of uh, clean and, uh, and good water is, is not really present, uh, particularly in low and middle income countries. Um, and uh, it might be a need to develop some new technologies. Uh, there's a lot of uh, bright um, minds out there and should be possible to find new solutions. Um, but I, I think it's also, um, it's important to to deliver the evidence and the knowledge and, and then disseminate that to the production and uh, and stakeholders and really uh, make sure that you educate food producers as well. Uh, so I, I think that I will leave it at that. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. So we have only a few minutes left, um, which <laughs> there's so many things that I, I wish we could talk about more. Um, and I do appreciate um, some of the panelists um, providing information um, in, in, the, in the chat so that we can access some of these resources. And um, do feel free to answer some of these questions because we do have that opportunity or to ask some of these questions in the chat because we, we may not have a chance to get to them now, but um, by at least writing them, we will be able to look at them later. So I have a very kind of quick um, question to all of um, the panelists. This is kind of a, a very, very brief response. If you could look forward 20 years um, and think about what is the necessity or that one thing that would um, really help to unite water quality, food safety, public health, and AMR, if you could only work on one thing for the next 20 years, I, I get that this is a very big question. Um, and I'm asking a lot of you to, to really condense that down and into 20 or 30 seconds. But if you could pick one thing that you must or be fundamental to see happen in the next 20 years, um, what would that be? Carmen? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that question, Eric. It's really interesting. So I'm going to be drawing on, on what Kate said about the need for going out from our comfort zone. Um, I, I really think that uh, we, in general, the world, we need to really think how we're going to restructure our food systems. And this is, um, I mean, this is the third conference in the past days where we are reflecting on the same uh, topics for, for all the different areas and all the different conf uh, conflicting interests uh, uh, competing food systems to to be able to find a manner to ensure what we have heard 
also in the first um, in the first panel, circular economy, sustainable production, and that this happens effectively. This is really a big, big challenge. It's going to be quite difficult to modify behaviors and also um, trends, and and um, and it requires the effort of everybody. So I, I look forward to seeing something done in that sense in the next twenty years. Thanks so much, Sarah. Your turn. Yeah, very quickly, uh, just building on Carmen and, and the last point you said, which I think is behavior and, and how we change that. We're all so used to working in our own little areas without thinking of the, the wider implications of that. And um, so building those uh, the, those relationships and, and, and understanding that what we say, what, what relates between the different sectors and um, how we can start to modify behavior so we actually listen to listen to others and their challenges and try to integrate them into what we have to do. Um, we probably have a lot of the information and solutions if we only spoke to each other more. Thanks so much, Sarah. Kate, your turn. Yeah, I'm going to have to go with, with sanitation, given that the human waste management is, is a real, or poor human waste management is such a barrier to to safe use of, of wastewater and, and agriculture. I, you know, I think we've got to, in the next 20 years, if we achieve SDG 6.2, that frankly, we're off track for that in 20 years. So that's, that's a huge challenge in front of us. We've got the SDG 6 Global Acceleration Framework that really kind of lays out what we need to do in terms of financing, data, capacity development, changes in governance and, and innovation. I think we need to, to really chase that down hard and, and get others on board with it, with us because it's important, you know, not just for human dignity, but, but for food systems, for antimicrobial resistance, so many other benefits will flow from, from achieving that. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, for Neil, the last words are yours. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I think I can just, uh, being the last one, echo uh, a lot of the others um, in, in just agreeing with them that, and particularly Sarah, that you need, we need to communicate and collaborate uh, because there's a lot of knowledge and um, I think uh, we can find solutions uh, if we talk together and uh, and really uh, work together as a whole uh, bringing in the the full picture um, I think that's uh, really valuable yeah all right well I would like to be the first to thank our panelists um, for being here today um, I know that I took a lot of notes and I might uh, be emailing you with some follow-up questions that I found very interesting that you raised. Um, so I would like to have a round of applause um, for, for our panelists today. I really do thank you for, for taking time out of your, your schedule and your work uh, to be here um, to share your expertise and knowledge um, with the participants of this. So thank you very much. Thank you for having so, us. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. So now it falls to me to kind of have like a closing summary of, of some of what was discussed today. And this is probably one of my least favorite uh, activities because I'm always at a loss with how to succinctly um, sum up some of the very great points that were raised. Um, and I find myself leaving this with more questions um, that need to be answered, which I also think is probably the, the point and purpose of this. Um, a central theme I think that came up was changing behavior and we, should, we need to get out of our comfort zone. And so when we attend to these things, we need to have that open mind that somebody else's perspective um, could very well be the solution or one of the solutions um, to a problem that you're experiencing, but they're coming at it from a different way. Um, and if we can kind of change that behavior and not only how we try to do the things that we've always been doing, but we look forward to see maybe new um, avenues that were not open to us before. We can perhaps tackle a problem in a different way um, and include kind of a few more people um, that weren't at the table before. And so if I guess I had to say what was the kind of the one thing that I took away from this. Um, so I, I, I realized I asked you all a very kind of difficult question um, to look forward 20 years. And so if I kind of had to put that same pressure on myself to really kind of sum up one thing that, that I'm going to take away from this discussion, especially on the intersection of public health, of food safety, of water quality, and of the problem of antimicrobial resistance, it probably would be that I think we are more connected than we are um, working in isolation. So 
I think we really need to utilize any of those connections that we make, um, all of those people with those different experiences, with those expertise that can provide a puzzle piece to the larger problem, I think we need to embrace. Um, and it, certainly our, our panelists provided um, many, many examples of, of where that intersection and interplay could come. And so that's one thing that, that I'm gonna take away with. And um, I would also be interested uh, to hear if you, what you walk away from um, from this panel. So feel, please feel free to drop it in the box, but I'm gonna take away um, that, especially in this area, and I imagine in more ways than one, we're very, we're more connected um, than we work in isolation. So we should really utilize those partnerships. Um, so I'm gonna thank everybody uh, for their participation um, in today's panel and for the presentations today. But please don't log off yet. Um, we do have a few housekeeping things of note. So for that, I'm going to turn it back to our original moderator, um, Omar, to, to wrap this up. Um, and again, thank you very much for your participation today. Thank you very much, Eric, for moderating the panel segment and for uh, really driving a stimulating discussion. Uh, I think that we've all uh, heard um, heard different ideas and perspectives from these different sectors, and that it's very important to look at these cross-cutting and multi-sectoral themes. Uh, so a big thank you again also to all of our speakers, panelists, participants, and moderators, organizers, and sponsors for attending this event and being a part of making this uh, successful. Uh, just a few, I wanted to give some, a few housekeeping notes just for the end of the session. Um, for everyone that uh, was asking in the Q&A box, the video recording of this session will be made available on the IWRA and also the IWRA conference website. And the presentation materials uh, will also be made available online. Regarding the questions that we were not able to address in this 90 minute segment, we are going to try to answer these questions and also make this information available online through the website as well. Thank you very much for attending the session and uh, I wish everybody a wonderful morning, afternoon and evening. Thank you very much everybody.